Uh, by the way, there's something called a kaiser meyer Olkin uh, measurement. It's a KMO measure. Uh, if, if, if you were going to, I'm going to write this down just because, you know, again, the purpose of all this is to, to put this stuff on your radar. Uh, it's not to really make you, uh, uh, you know, excellent at ANCOVA or repeated measures or even factor analysis. It's just to put all this stuff on your radar uh, to let you know that it is available when it comes time to uh, potentially use it for research or your master's thesis. Okay. Uh, wow, gang. Um, I think we're ready to do some cool stuff. All right. Now, one thing I want you to, uh, to, 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 to kind of forget from the last video, uh, is there is a command in R called principal, and I think I used the P-R-I-N-C-O-M-P command previously. I like this one better. This is the one I'm going to use in this video because I like the flexibility that it, it, it gives us in transitioning from pr principal component analysis uh, into factor analysis. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to make that very, very, very clear um, uh, in, this, uh, in this video. So, so guys, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get out of this. Uh, probably not going to be over here much more. Everything we're going to do from here on out uh, is going to uh, uh, just, we're going to look at in R. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, this principal command requires psych to be downloaded, the, the, the package psych to be installed. So, But if you're following along, you should have already done that. So, guys, uh, what I want to do is I want to run my initial principal component analysis using my data set. <clears throat> And I want my number of factors to always be the number of variables. So again, I had algebra, trig, so on and so forth. I had six of those. So I want uh, my number, and that should be factors, not factor. And I want my rotation initially to be equal to none. Okay. Now, uh, before uh, with... PCA, you have to run a summary, okay? Not for this one. If you run the summary, you're really not going to get anything that's that, that's that interesting. Uh, for the principal uh, command in R, you just run what you've named uh, the model, okay? Now, when you, uh, <clears throat> when, when you run this, you get a lot of stuff, okay? And I guess it's my job to... Um, uh, to go through this and uh, uh, you know to talk it through with you. First of all, uh, notice that it's just calling the command. Notice that it's giving you a pattern matrix. Now this is or uh, well we've done no rotation yet, but uh, there's something called an adjusted matrix and a pattern matrix. Depending on the type of rotation that we end up doing, it'll depend on the type of matrix that uh, that will actually. Uh, uh, look at okay, and of course this is based on the correlation matrix. These scores right here are called the principal component loadings, and because we have yet we haven't done a rotation yet, these principal component loadings aren't of interest to us yet. Okay, so let's just completely ignore those for now. Those six numbers. Those six numbers with problem solving, we don't care about those just yet. Now, these H2s and U2s do mean a little something to us, but again, not just yet, but they will. Guys, this H2 column stands for the common commonalities. Uh, let me go back over here and write this down. So H2... stand for the commonalities, and U2 <laughs> sounds like a band, right? U2 uh, uh, is 1 minus H2, and this is called the unique 
variance of each variable. So flashing neon lights around this baby right here, okay? Uh, the unique variance. Now guys, the one that we typically uh, look at the most uh, is the H2. And uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, not that uh, uh, exciting in this data set because all of our H2s are equal to one, but we've retained all of our components. We have uh, all six components without rotation. So you can think about this kind of as your saturated model. Remember running that through, it's not a saturated model, but you can kind of think about it. We've retained all the components. We're explaining all the variation in calculus, trig, so on and so forth through these components because uh, we have everything included. So guys, uh, in the initial run, what I've got highlighted right here is pretty much irrelevant. But what is extremely relevant at this stage are the numbers that we get right here. Okay? Now, um, The, what I want you to know, well, I want you to know a lot of stuff. First of all, these numbers right here, 3.1, 1.35, 0.55, 0.49, 0.28, 0.29, 0 0.30, 0 0.30, those are called eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues tell us the percentage of variance that each of the subject areas uh, uh, explain. So... For, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, subject areas, our components. So component number one, the eigenvalue is 3.1. So 3.1 out of six components, which is 52%, which you'll see right there under the proportion of variance, is explained by component number one. Component number two is 1.35. So 1.35 divided by 6 tells us that approximately, oh, okay, that about 22% of the variance uh, is explained by component 2. 9% is uh, explained by component 3, 8% component 4, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, There's, there's a lot of rules of thumb out there, but our focus is now turning on which components do we keep and which do we eliminate. And probably the strongest rule of thumb, the most consistently implemented rule of thumb that I see is we keep all components that have eigenvalues greater than one. So when I look at the eigenvalues here, 3.1 and 1.35, we get into uh, principal component number three, which is less than one. It looks like to me right now that we have a two-factor model. We need to retain two components because cumulatively these two components explain 74% in the variance. I'm sorry, 74% of the variance that collectively trig algebra, all six uh, subject areas uh, explain. So guys, it looks like to me that uh, uh, we're looking at a two-factor model, but I don't know that yet. So let's just continue to explore some stuff and see what happens. Next thing I'd want to look at in helping me determine how many components I want to retain, and again, guys, as I said before, this is a reduction process. We're trying to reduce this thing down to the smallest number of components that we're still happy with the variance that it's explaining uh, from the original uh, observed variables. Now, another thing we can look at is we can examine a scree plot. And we get that by just plot. So I want to run my PCA, but I want to look at my, uh, my values from my PCA. <clears throat> And I want to run my type, first of all, as B. Now, these scree plots have the option of running the values by lines, points, or lines and points. So if you're running lines and points, which I'm going to do right here, you put a B for both. Okay? 
Now, this is a scree plot, and this is another determining help uh, another uh, a picture that we can use to determine the number of components we need to retain. And what we need to look at here is what's something called a point of reflection. And a point of reflection is where our vertical tendencies and horizontal tendencies meet. All right, so I'm going to start right here at this point up here. And you can see that, uh, again, look at the, this is, these are nothing more than our eigenvalues. Uh, 3.1, uh, 1.35, and so on and so forth. Now, if I start at my highest point and I come down to the first factor, notice my vertical move. <clears throat> when I come to my second factor, notice that I don't change much the vertical movement. But when I go from the second factor to the third factor, I start more of a horizontal move. So my vertical looks like that it's best from this factor to this factor. Now I'm going to examine the horizontal move. So I'm horizontal, not much change, not much change, a lot of change. So my horizontal move is from here to here. So if I look at where my horizontal move with my vertical move actually intersect, that's called the inflection point. Looks like to me it, uh, the inflection point right here at, uh, at, at the third component. So it looks like to me that we have a one, two component model uh, that we need to retain. So I'm kind of focusing on two factors, all right? Or I should say two components. So I'm going to rerun my model. So I'm now going to call this PCA1. So all I did with PCA, my original model, is just look at all of my components, all six of my components, same number of components I have, observed variables, and I'm looking to see, uh, again, it's a reduction process, I'm looking to see which ones I can eliminate to reduce the structure of the model. So, uh, guys, here I'm going to go data, but now I'm going to go in factors equal to, because from my previous analysis that seems reasonable. And I don't want to do anything fancy yet. I still don't want to do any rotation. That's when things get, uh, uh, get really cool. All right, PCA1. And I get something similar to what I got before, but, um, you know, I get something cleaner. First of all, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've still got a pattern matrix based on correlation matrix. That's just as before. But notice now that my principal component loadings have changed a little bit. This 0.82, negative 0.39, still not interesting. Why? Because we've done no rotation. Still not interesting, still not interesting, still not interesting. Am I making my point? Am I getting on, my, on your nerves yet? I'm getting on my nerves, not interesting. But what is interesting now are the commonalities and the uniqueness of the variance explained in calculus trig and problem solving. Now let me explain to you what this means. This 83 right here, point 0.83, is again the commonality. Now think about it, commonality, common variance, shared variance. 83 tells us that, uh, I should say the point 0.83 corresponding to calculus tells us that 83% of the variance in calculus is shared variance. The spread in calculus is shared with other subject matters. Only 17% of the variance in calculus is unique. And that kind of makes sense because if you go into calculus, think about integrating. Sometimes being able to integrate requires, uh, or I should say relies on algebraic manipulation. It relies on uh, just, just arithmetic skills. Sometimes the ability or lack thereof uh, uh, to, to perform integration sometimes relies on your ability to add or subtract fractions. Uh, the least shared variance is in logic. So again, not interesting, not interesting. Okay, I'll stop. 
interesting, interesting, and so on. But guys, there's nothing more interesting than this part right here. Well, other than this part down here. But for right now, let's talk about this. And if you look at it, nothing different, right? The only difference is instead of a six-component model, we have reduced this thing to a two-component model because these two components explain a cumulative percentage of variance that I'm happy with. Two. I don't think I gained anything by going to the adding the third component, anything uh, significant. Okay. So guys, I'm feeling more and more comfortable uh, <clears throat> with this two-factor. Now again, let let me say one more thing. Back here, notice before this was a one, so 100% of the variance was shared. But guys, again, you had a full component model. You had all six components. Uh, you're going to lose some of that shared variance just because. Uh, you've uh, uh, eliminated some of the, the components. All right. Now, um, is sample size an issue? Well, I was going to go back over here. Back to sample size. Now, the 300 uh, that I talked about, 500, 1,000, was based on, uh, you know, all the components. But, uh, um, you know, now we're focusing on the two components, not six components, not the, the full model, if you will. So there's a rule of thumb that says that uh, if the averages of our H2s are greater than 0.6, then sample size is okay for the current structure. And our structure is two components. So gang, I can go back over. Well, maybe, maybe not. I can go back over. Uh, and look at uh, the averages of my H2s. Guys, all of them are above 0.6. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Okay, so everything I have so far based on, uh, 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 you know, what's the correct uh, number of components to reduce uh, our full model two, I'm thinking the two uh, is uh, uh, is the correct answer. But guess what? Still not convinced. Always helps if you guys, if I put that where you can read it. Then, okay. So there's one other method <clears throat> that uh, I think uh, will help me out a lot. And what this does is it compares what's uh, called our original correlation matrix with the reproduced correlation matrix. Now you can think of this as our components are equal to six. You can think of this as our components equal to two. So are these things uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, are they, uh, are they comparable? And uh, at, at the end of the day, <laughs> you can just create a residual of these and take your original minus your reproduced, and you can actually get the difference in the correlation uh, between what you started with and what you ended up with with your uh, uh, 
uh, with your last model. So uh, uh, let, let's go do that. Um, Now, to get my reproduced uh, correlation matrix, what I do is I go, f I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, okay, what do I want to do? I'm going I'm to call this COR, okay? And I want to call this uh, the reproduced. Okay, so... Uh, uh, this the way I do this is factor model, and I want this off of PCA one, and I want this to be off the loadings. 